Hello, there's a, a short video clip, uh, pretty much on request really, from um, uh, an individual who sent a few questions to me with regards to chase sequences. Um, and I know that I've done uh, quite a bit of um, video beforehand and, and a, a bit of um, explanation in, with regards to livestock chasing and livestock killing. But in this instance, what we're going to look at is chase in general. So um, chase with regards to any moving object, right? so whether that's cats or bicycles or vehicles or whatever. Um, for me personally, um, the chase behaviour or the ability to stop or um, to recall from a chase is without a shadow of a doubt um, the most important behaviour that you can ever teach a dog. It's, it's basically a recall, isn't it? But it's a recall under extreme circumstances. It, it sits up there in, in terms of um, the frequency of complaints um, that are received, which, which people um, deem to be problematic for their dogs. You have pulling on the lead, you have failing to recall, um, you have uh, chase behaviours, um, aggression, um, and, and things like that basically, or reactivity, I say aggression, I mean reactivity. They, they're your sort of like top group, and I, I, I discount things like house soiling, um, which are to a lesser extent, if you like. The reason that I would ch um, put um, particularly reactivity, um, chase and recall so high is because they jeopardise the welfare of the dog or of some third party, whether that's a human being or um, some other form of, of um, life. So they're, they're what I'd classify as behaviours that need to be um, in place, that need to be sound among, ab above everything else. Whether, you're, whether your thing is agility, fly ball, um, you know, competition, heel work, whatever, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, that, that's all fantastic, but you have to have the ability to be able to recall your dog when your dog is performing a behaviour that is detrimental to their welfare or the welfare of somebody else. So why is the chase behaviour so difficult to um, modify? And by modify I mean that the dog has already learned that it's okay to chase. It already gets a thrill from it and it already does it. Um, it's important to stipulate that every dog born has within it the um, predisposition to chase. It's part and parcel of um, the life of any dog um, because basically it is what would lead to food for that animal. Um, and so it's important that it's retained within the dog um, at some level and whether or not or how much it, it is um, brought to the surface depends on A, the animal's experience and also in, in certain cases selected breeding processes. So for example with a Border Collie I may want the Border Collie to have, if you look at your chase sequence, what's, what's termed the chase sequence for a dog, um, which is basically to, to find the prey, to see the prey, to stalk the prey, to chase the prey, to grab the, cake, the prey, bite it, kill it, dissect and eat if you like. Um, with a border collie, anything beyond the stalk and the slight chase is basically considered a, a, a fault. You don't want the dog biting. Um, with cattle dogs, yes, you can, you can have the biting, but you don't want it biting to the point that you're going to be starting taking chunks out of the animal. So it, it is within, it can be beneficial, you know, depending on the use for the dog, but primarily for your domestic pet, the chase sequence is, is problematic. Um, the reason that it is so difficult to modify, as well as the fact that it is in there, is that it is what is termed a self-rewarding behaviour. Okay? The dog gets pleasure from the chase in and of itself. Whether it actually achieves the end result of grabbing hold of the bicycle, car, cat, sheep, whatever it is, is neither here nor there. It is the chase in itself that reinforces further chases because it causes a release of chemicals, which are, which are for the dog pretty addictive, um, and they will chase those, those chemicals. They're enjoyable, you know, I'm not gonna go into the whole spiel of the chemicals that are released and the neurological processes that, um, you know, take place throughout the chase sequence. However, it's safe to say that the dog enjoys the chase without the actual capture at the end. That is why it's extremely difficult to modify. It's a bit like um, sex, I think I've said this before, it's a bit like sex for human beings. Um, in that sex in itself is a means to an end. The idea is that you're supposed to produce offspring. However, as everybody knows, sex in itself is a pleasurable experience, more so than the production of offspring in many cases. So if you look at chase as in similar to, to um, the sexual behaviours, um, it is something that the dog is going to, once it's done it, and once it's done it a few times, and the more times the better, the harder it is to modify. Certainly, if you are using non-corrective procedures. Now this is going to get a few hackles up on people because there are plenty of people who claim that it is possible to um, stop or to modify for life a, a confirmed chase sequence in a dog which has basically 
um, repeated that sequence and gained satisfaction from doing it without using any form of corrective intervention whatsoever. I've asked repeatedly um, for anybody to show me um, consistent footage of before and after footage of a confirmed chasing dog. Okay, so we see a vehicle and we see a dog chasing after it. Full intent to chase that vehicle. And then we see following the training procedure, the non-corrective training procedure, we see the same dog off lead with vehicles going by, paying no attention to them whatsoever. But I haven't seen it. If somebody could show it me, I'd be absolutely delighted to go into the processes that we used in order to um, obtain that result. But what you generally find is that the majority of training advice concerns management or restriction, prevention, stopping the dog from being able to do it in the first place, which is absolutely fine, but in the real world it doesn't hold up because dogs can slip collars, different people can walk dogs who aren't completely as on money as the owner, excuse me, as the owner of the dog themselves. And also who wants to have a dog that lives its life on a lead? You know, so you can say, okay, well walk somewhere where there's no vehicles. Very difficult, very, very difficult if you live in an urban, um, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, urban surroundings. And if you want to say, take livestock, well walk your dog where there's no livestock. Equally very difficult if you're somebody who lives in rural surroundings. So the important thing here is not to sort of like make excuses as to blaming the individual for, well, well it's because you walk it there, it's because you let them off the lead, or it's because you didn't have, you know, um, uh, tasty enough treats in your pocket, or you hadn't worked enough on your play drive with the dog to be able to utilise toys to recall. The fact is the dog will only learn from a consequence of that behaviour. If I perform a behaviour continually, 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 and the response, the, the, the consequence to that behaviour is positive and it's beneficial to me, in that I either gain something that I want or I remove something that I don't want, I'm going to keep doing it. It's the laws of learning, I'm going to keep doing it. If, however, I perform a behaviour and something negative happens that I didn't expect, and it happens again, and it happens again, and it happens again, and I can't actually find a way around it to perform my behaviour without that negative thing happening, then that behaviour is going to desist, it's going to go away, it's going to cease. And the more um, consistent I am in the negative um, outcome for that behaviour, the less likely that behaviour is to occur in the future. What I can then do is bring in my alternative behaviour, which is what some um, individuals would have as, as the lock stock answer. I bring that in and then train with that, so say, okay, well, this is no longer allowed, even whilst you're off lead, it's negative, but look how positive this is. So now I've got a dog that sort of sees the vehicle, sees the bicycle, sees the cats or whatever that it wanted to chase in the first place, it's got a negative association with those now. But I still want to be able to give the dog something to do. I don't just want it to plod along thinking, I don't want to go near that, I don't want to go near that. So instead I switch it back onto myself and make me and what I have to offer the dog the alternative far more rewarding than it has been in the past in many instances and certainly than the alternative of switching back to old habits and going into a chase mode on an inappropriate target. The, the key thing here is that it, or if you're working on lines, if you're working on leads or whatever, you can do all of this with leash corrections. Okay, so But your problem then is when you take the lead off, how do you correct? When my dog's 50 50 metres away from me. Oh, your dog should never be 50 metres away from you. Well, I apologise for the fact that I allow my dogs to run. You know, I like my dogs to expend energy in the most natural way possible for them. I like them to run as a group. I like them to run as individuals. I like them to swim. I can't let my dog swim in sea on a long line. Equally, if my dog decides that he chases vehicles, my dog's swimming in the sea off a long line and a vehicle happens to drive alongside the road, which runs alongside the beach, I want to know that my dog isn't going to chase that vehicle or if it crosses its mind to chase that vehicle, I'm in a position to be able to intersect and to be able to redirect that behaviour back onto something more positive. The only means possible of doing that are with remote training aids. I would absolutely really, really hope that people would educate themselves into what a remote training collar is actually all about. Don't bother, or you can read as much as you like, but don't bother forming an opinion based on somebody else's preconceived idea of what remote training entails. Remote training today is to remote training 10 years ago what riding a, a, a road bike, a £3,000 road bike is today to riding a penny farthing. They are worlds apart. So preconceived notions based on um, tools that were used um, in the past and that have now become antiquated and that people have looked at and thought, whoa, that was too high, that was too strong, that was too painful, that was wrong. 
and they've learned from that and they've adjusted and brought the collars right the way down so we're now able to um, deliver levels of stimulation which basically you cannot feel until it becomes the slightest tickle and you're working your dog on a slight tickle or slightly higher than that or slightly higher than that which is able to match the adrenaline rise in the dog in, 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 um, uh, in conjunction with the chemical release based on whatever the stimulus happens to be that's getting that dog's arousal going there is nothing inhumane in the professional use of a remote training aid in fact it will save your dog's life and it will likely save the life of the driver who swerves to try not to hit your dog that is running out because in this situation your tennis ball or your kibble or your chicken or your whatever else has failed and you weren't in time to grab hold of the lead that the dog's yanked out of your hand because it's so intent on chasing after the vehicle. Okay, now I'm not saying that it is impossible to train a dog with um, uh, non-compulsive methods. Absolutely not. All of my dogs have been trained with non-compulsive methods. However, where your dog has got an existing behaviour and that existing behaviour is so strong that it cannot be bought with alternatives, the only way that you can interrupt that existing behaviour is with a corrective measure. All right, call it an aversive, call it a punishment, call it whatever you want to call it. It is the only means of breaking the dog's attention and focus from that stimulus onto the appropriate stimulus that you want. The reason being is that it's working on the dog's uh, preconceived consequences. Okay, so what the dog expects to happen. You are breaking expectations, you are disconfirming expectations, and you are redirecting them onto a new outcome, a new consequence, something the dog wasn't expecting. The more and more the dog comes to expect that negative consequence, then we can cease with the negative consequence. And when I'm saying negative, I'm not talking about giving dogs pain. I'm not talking about creating dogs that are fearful of their environment. I'm not talking creating about destroying bonds. Uh, nothing. All of these dogs that, that I have have all had correction as part of their training. They are the most loving, most you know, uh, open, most most playful, uh, most enjoyable dogs to be around because the stimulation on collars where remote training collars has been used at an appropriate level at appropriate time at the appropriate um, intensity for the appropriate reason it's also been stopped at the appropriate time and the appropriate um, uh, reward has been delivered following the stimulation so the stimulation becomes second place you're working on a ratio of about 95 to 5 in terms of reward to um, uh, punishment to negative consequence to correction so it really is something that happens only in that situation, but in every other situation, life's good, life's fun. Well, it doesn't take a genius to figure out, well, I'm better off doing the things that are fun in life than I am doing the one that's given me the negative consequence. The problem comes is when you get um, certain individuals who are so set or, uh, with a doctrine of do not do this, do not do this, do not do this, chanting this mantra that it will um, damage your dog, that it will ruin your relationship, that it will cause superstitious associations, that it will cause... Murray Sidman, who wrote Coercion and its Fallout, has a lot to answer for because the word behavioural fallout is thrown about so often and yet what a lot of people um, fail to realise is that if you read Sidman's book, he actually has a phrase in there which says something along the lines of an occasional correction will not do anything to damage the relationship. But what it will do is show that uh, an important boundary has been overstepped. As long as you switch straight back into reward, 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 it isn't a problem. But it is also um, highly uh, important to stress that the level of correction, the timing of correction, the reason for correction, the cessation for correction, and the choice of correction used are all considered. You have to be able to consider these things before you start correcting, which is why, and I'm not touting for business for, for um, myself and for my own business, that's neither here nor there, but I would ask that if you're going to choose a trainer and you're going to ask for corrective measures to be brought in to um, enhance the welfare of your dog or for some third party life form, that that is done with a trainer who is able to um, articulate exactly what they're doing, why they're doing it, the alternatives that they may consider with you, and they're also able to demonstrate it. And they're able to demonstrate it not just on their own dogs, but on other dogs. They're able to give you a, a catalogue of um, situations whereby they have modified behaviours by using correction as part of an overall reward process. Um, or that they're able to give you testimonials, not just written testimonials, but things whereby you can actually speak to the person with whom they've trained and you can see that person's dog 
um, in action, you know, as long as that person's happy. Um, uh, you know, so if you have a chasing dog and you can now see it and see how the dog is amongst a formerly um, chaser list in stimuli. Um, so that, that's basically the, the nature of this clip here, is just to say, um, to put forward my thoughts on correction in terms of chase, um, why it is necessary, the, um, the, the guidelines, if you like, very briefly, the guidelines that need to be adhered um, to if you're going to consider correction, and the fact that if you um, go down the road of shelling out cash to um, somebody who's just saying, uh, you know, put a harness on the dog, put a head holster on the dog, divert the dog's attention back onto yourself on a line and there you go, now your problem's solved. There are, do you know, it feels wrong, I'm, I'm nobody silly. Everybody knows that when you're doing this, yeah, okay, my dog might be able to do it in this situation, but I want to take the lead off. Um, so if you're not working with somebody who says, okay, now take the lead off and here comes the, here comes the um, stimuli that have um, formerly caused your dog to chase, I would strongly suggest that you reconsider your trainer and look for somebody who is um, perhaps more um, skilled and experienced in that particular area. Okay, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Bye-bye.